Black or white, chicken or pasta, Postgres or MySQL. There's often a universe of other options and uh, a really good tool for, for a job. And Mark Andre will now talk about choosing the right database for your project. Oh, hello. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you very much uh, to Tom for this very inspirational talk. Uh, it's going to be very, very hard to <laughs> match that one. So this is going to be a more like a technical talk. It's going to give you some advice about uh, what you can do to choose a database um, and also some options that you have. So a bit about myself. I'm Mark Andre Lemberg. Um, I have been with Python for a very, very long time, since 1994. Uh, I'm one of the core developers, not doing anything much uh, nowadays, just you know, commenting on things. But if you know Unicode, then uh, that was me. Um, I'm also very busy in the Python community. So uh, I have been on the board of the Python Software Foundation. I'm a fellow. Uh, I've been on the board uh, and also chair of the EuroPython Society running EuroPython. And I'm based in Düsseldorf. So, to head on into the talk, so let's assume you're thinking of building the next big thing, right? Like Eiffel was at the time. And you need a database. Why do you need a database? Databases are usually boring stuff, right? But you need a foundation for whatever project you want to run. You need a foundation that helps you scale later on when your, your startup is growing very fast. And so you need to make a good choice right from the start. Now, choosing a database nowadays is a bit harder than it was something like 30 years ago. Uh, and the reason is because 30 years ago, you had maybe 20 or so databases to choose from, realistically. Nowadays, you have over 800. So what do you do if you want to choose a database? Of course, you go to the database of databases. And uh, this is actually a very good site. Uh, you can, you can you know, get information about lots and lots of different databases. You can do searches and queries. And I'm going to give you a few inputs of what you can do to drive this website and, and make a decision. So why do we have 800 databases now? Well, the reason is that in the last 30 years, lots and lots of startups have developed. And lots and lots of startups found that the existing options that they had were not sufficient to actually make their their service or their, their offering work. And so pretty much all the big companies that you know, Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, Uber, uh, lots of other companies, they basically took what was available or created completely new databases specific for their needs. And they typically needed something very, very stable, very fast, some with very fast intake, some with very fast analytics. Um, they even went to GPUs, for example, to, to make their database uh, logic work at the scale and at the performance that they needed. And so that's why we have so many different databases now. Of course, you can always you know, use the safe kind of approach. In, in open source, you'd always choose MySQL or maybe MariaDB, or you choose uh, PostgreSQL, which is uh, probably the, the most advanced open source database that we have nowadays in the uh, in this space, and, and you're pretty much, you know, it'll work. And you will find lots and lots of people who know these databases. But of course, if you're a startup, if you have a great new idea, then you want to be competitive. So you might lose a competitive edge if you just go with one of these systems. So what can you do to select a database in a, in a let's say, proper way, in an objective way, in a, in a very, um, you know, hands-on, kind of approach, go down a list of things that you need, go down uh, the list of, of features that databases have, and then make a match and then pick one of those. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of these things that you have to know. So one thing is that you need to know about the data load. So what kind of data you're going to have in the database. Uh, there are quite a few intended use cases that you will probably have, and you need to match those to features that the databases have. There's some additional decision factors which don't really fit into this uh, kind of approach that I'm taking here. And you have to go out to the market and do some research. And of course, then, you know, pick one, run with it. If you have a larger project, and I will always uh, recommend run, running a, a POC, a, a basically a proof of part, uh, concept, that the database that you're likely to choose is actually going to work out for you. 
So let's head on into this list. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to decide which kind of data load you're going to have. Uh, how many of you know OLTP and OLAP? Next to none, which is amazing. So <laughs> these, these two are the, the basic, um, basic you know, models that you have in, in database technology. So o OLTP basically means that you want to use the database for operational work. So data changes often. You, for example, you have a CRUD interface, so you want to make changes to the database very often. You have a user da database, let's say, and the user wants to go in and make some changes. That would be an OLTP data load. Now, there's, there's a second one, which is called the OLAP data load. OLAP means on, uh, online analytical processing, and this is basically for taking the data that's in the database and extracting and creating reports from the database. Of course, you can say, well, ideally, I would like both. But reality has it that implementing a database that actually performs well at both of these data loads is almost impossible. You can get there by using certain workarounds. You can get there by using certain tricks. Um, for example, you can have two databases, one for OLTP, and then you extract the data and put it into an OLAP database. Um, those are options that you have. But you need to make this decision very early on in your uh, in your process. So let's have a look at some use cases. Uh, I'm going to present you a longer list of use cases. Uh, some of these use cases that you need to look into are known, so you know that you need these features. Um, the more problematic one, especially when you're a startup, is things that you don't know yet. So very often you have to plan for changes. You have to plan for new designs that you want to make, let's say, five years into your startup. So you have to plan for both. And that's very important to do right from the start. So you have to choose for a database that's flexible and, and can adapt to your needs. So what I did here is I, I basically broke down things in very, various complexity uh, dimensions. And I'm going to go through all of these one by one. There may be more. This is not necessarily the complete list. And they're just su suggestions on how to approach this. So first thing that you have to look into is schema complexity. How many of you know what a schema is? Okay, a few. For the others, it's basically a way of how you design your database. So how you design your tables in the database, how you assign the, the, uh, the data um, types, the data structures, how you connect the different tables with each other. You can do that in various different ways. So simple schemas, for example, are schemas that are used in, in let's say, a web server, a logging service, if you want to maintain messages, event storage maybe. Um, another case would be complex schemas. Complex schemas you typically have if you have you know, very complex systems like, like accounting systems, or maybe you want to merge different backends into one new database. Uh, and then what you typically get is you get very complex setups. Now, databases can typically handle both of these very easily. Where it gets more difficult is migrations. Migrations means you want to change the schema from one schema version to the next. And managing that is hard. So that's something to watch out for. Next is the, the cardinal complexity. So cardinal com complexity basically means that how much data are you going to put into your database? Are you going to have tables with lots of rows, lots of columns, or you have something uh, that, that has both? You need to also look into growth of your data. So you need to have an estimate for how quickly the data in your database is going to grow. Another complexity is temporal complexity. So you have to look into how often does your data change in the database? Or are you uh, in the situation that you have a need to restore data to a certain point in time? Some basic databases can do this, others cannot. If you choose one that cannot, and later on you find you need this, it's very hard to add in retrospect. Of course, very basic is the query complexity. So you have to look into the performance of your database. How, how fast can the database do certain operations, like, for example, joins, when you want to get data out of multiple tables? Or you have certain performance requirements, so you don't want the users to wait a long time for their reports to show up. You can address these things. You can improve performance, for example, by doing normalization or denormalization. Normalization means that you basically try to split everything in, out into tables, into different tables. So you basically use the dry principle. 
Denormalization is the exact reverse of this. You, so you basically duplicate data in multiple tables. And the reason you do that is in order to avoid having to do joins at runtime. And if you are into data science and data engineering, you often have to have views on the data. View is basically something that dynamically gets created by the database. It's essentially just a more complex select statement that you have there. But modern databases have a feature called materialized views. So you can actually tell the database, OK, please take the data out of this query and then turn it into a real table and manage that for me. So that's also a feature to look into. Next is deployment complexity. So how do you want to deploy your database? Are you going to deploy it on, on let's say, um, bare metal? Are you going to put it onto, onto VMs? Are you going to have containers? Are you going to have Kubernetes for scaling, for example? Are you going to put it into the cloud? Those are things that you have to be aware of right from the start. You also have to look at where you store the, the data that you actually want to manage. So there are systems that can store the data directly in memory, and obviously they're very fast. You can store data next to the compute engine, so let's say using NFS, for example, or you can put it on, on like a cloud storage, like S3, for example. There are many different uh, things to look into, all very important. And of course, you know, if your database goes down, then your, your startup will probably go down very quickly as well, so you have to be aware of how to make your, your database setup very resilient and also plan for disaster recovery because you know, things happen. So databases go down, data gets lost, sometimes you need to recover. And finally, operational complexity. So how are you going to manage the installation that you have? Are you going to do everything yourself? Are you going to run it on your own hardware? Are you going to have a, a cloud service, let's say Amazon or uh, GCS or Azure, handle the management of the database for you? For a startup, I would always recommend doing the latter because it's just uh, you have other things to worry about. But if you, if you grow up, if you scale up, then this might be too costly for you. So you might want to look at other options. You also want to automate the whole setup, the integration. Let's say a database uh, goes down, then you need to quickly uh, basically reinitialize it, reset it up. Um, if you want to scale up, you want to add more, more workers, then you need automation for that as well. There are various options for this. You have to look into that. And of course, upgrades are a big issue. If you go from one database version to the next, very often databases require that you take down the database, and typically you don't want that. And there are various ways of working around that. Databases have uh, zero time upgrade options that you can use, so you have to look into that as well. Sometimes you can afford going down with the database. Sometimes you can't. Like Amazon, for example, wouldn't be able to go down with the database in a like Black Friday week, right? So that's something to be aware of. And then finally, you have additional decision factors which basically don't fit in into these categories, but they're, of course, very important for you as a Python programmer because you have to be sure that you can use Python to actually talk to the database, and, and the interfaces, uh, they should be mature and should be well developed. And that's very important, because uh, sometimes if you find that you have bugs in your interfaces, then this can hurt really badly. Um, something that's probably not for you to decide, uh, but more for the investors to decide, is the, the cost implications of your choice, right? So. If you have a very expensive service, if you, for example, use uh, AWS for, to run in your database and you have lots of data in your database, then AWS will be very, very expensive. And that's something to consider. Might be worth it, may not be worth it. Depends on uh, how you look at it. And because databases get developed very quickly nowadays, it's always very important to look at the maturity of the database. Right, that was the first part. I'm good at time, so let's do some database testing. So I, I chose a, a couple of different areas of databases that you can look into. Uh, we will have a look at general purpose databases, more specific databases, databases that have uh, various different, uh, use different technologies, use different ways of storing data. So let's head on into this one. Let's first start with the general purpose OLTP client server databases. Uh, these are the Postgres, the MySQLs, the Maria databases, the Oracles, the SQL servers, and the DB2s. 
How many of you know DB2? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so this, you know, choice of databases changes very quickly, and, and some databases are more popular at certain times than others. For example, DB2 was very popular in the 80s and 90s of the last decade. Um, everyone used Oracle. Uh, SQL Server got more and more popular in, in, in recent decades and is being used in, for example, uh, the finance industry a lot. Um, but nowadays, many people use uh, Postgres and, and MySQL or MariaDB for, for basically as a general purpose OLTP database. And of course, you get cloud versions of everything. So if you don't want to manage the database yourself, you can just go to one of the cloud vendors and get a service there. And it's a very good way to start. Next is in-memory databases or embedded databases. How many of you know SQLite? Okay, quite a few. So SQLite does come with Python, so there's nothing to install, not even the pip install. You can just import the SQLite module and you have a database. So that's a very easy way to get into database programming. Uh, DuckDB is a very interesting new database. Uh, whereas SQLite is more an operational database, DuckDB has emphasis on analysis and reporting. So if you have a, uh, an, an application that needs a lot of reporting or you want to do reporting on, on data that you get, then having a look at DuckDB is a very good thing. How many of you know DuckDB? No one. Ah, one. <laughs> so def definitely try it out. It's, it's brand new. It's... Um, it, well, it's, it's kind of young, but they're using all kinds of, uh, you know, very clever academic uh, research in there. Um, and it's a great database. It's very fast. Um, and it's definitely something to try out. It's just a pip install away. And it's just like SQLite. If you do the pip install, you get the database together with the Python interface. So there's nothing more to install. Uh, how many of you know Exasol? One. <laughs> okay. XSL is also a very interesting option. It's, uh, I just put it on this page. It doesn't really fit into SQLite and DuckDB kind of setups, but it's, uh, it's an in-memory database and also only runs on in-memory. It, it does store data on, on disk as well, but for performance reasons, it, it loads the whole database into memory. And if you have a database that is too big to fit into memory, it uses a cluster for this. And of course, uh, it's, it's focusing on OLAP, so basically quick analysis because that's what, it's, what it was uh, developed for. This is a commercial database, but it's, uh, it's, it's extremely fast if you're looking for something like that. Next is data warehouses. How many of you know what a data warehouse is? Okay, quite a few actually. So just for the others, data warehouses are basically setups where you have multiple databases, often for different systems, and you want to put them all into a single kind of database system I mean, those databases, and then hopefully also interact with these uh, different databases that you have in there. Uh, the ideal form would be that you basically integrate all your data into a single database, but realistically, this rarely happens. Uh, it's just a way to, to have an organized way of storing your data for the company. Now, there are various options for this. Uh, one is, for example, Snowflake. That's a very popular one. Google has BigQuery. Azure has Synapse and Anal Analytics. Um, with Amazon, you can use Redshift. Those are all very nice, uh, very scalable, very big, um, sometimes very costly. You can also use a Postgres compatible one, which is called Greenplum. How many of you have heard of Greenplum? Yeah, two maybe? So that's a very interesting project. They're basically taking uh, Postgres, the Coast, Coast, uh, Postgres uh, core, and they forked it and added clustering and added, um, you know, scalability. So you can very, very easily turn it into a very, very, uh, you know, capable database for lots and lots of data, terabytes of data. How many of you know terabyte, uh, Teradata? Sorry. Also a few. So Teradata was basically, I would guess it was the, the database that basically created this whole data warehouse thing. So... Uh, it's not used that much anymore. It used to be run um, on-prem. You actually bought the appliances, so you put the appliance into your data center and you, you ran it. Nowadays, it's just a cloud platform. Um, I'm not hearing a lot about Teradata anymore, but it's definitely a very, very good database. 
So next is data lake. How many of you know what a data lake is? We just had a talk this uh, early on this morning about data lakes and data warehouses. Um, there was one slide there. Essentially, the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse is in a data lake, you just throw in everything that you have, and you don't really care about what it is, what you're going to use it for. It's essentially the Google approach to, to uh, maintaining data. Google has always stored everything that you ever gave them, and they also never delete anything. So um, that's how Google works, because they always thought that, you know, maybe in you know, 10 years' time, there will be some use case for, for that particular piece of data, and so why not just store it? And they had the, the capabilities for doing that, and so they did it. Nowadays, it's also possible for you to do this. For example, a typical approach is that you store things on S3. Uh, you just throw everything on S3, and then you use Amazon Athena to query the data that you have on S3. So you don't really need to put an extra database on top. Athena will basically do this for you. And Athena works very in a very similar way to Apache Presto. Um, Apache Presto is, well, whereas Athena is a service, Apache Presto is actually software that you can install under the Apache license. Uh, Presto and Trino are actually basically two systems um, that they unfortunately forked. I don't know exactly know why, but uh, it's essentially more or less the same system with Trino being the more popular one nowadays. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting system because it only provides the compute for you. So it's basically a database without the storage, uh, very much like Athena. Athena uses S3 as storage, and uh, Apache, Presto, and Trina can use S3 as backend as well. But they can also use other systems. Um, Data Lake is another system that you can use. Uh, it's also open source, uh, but there's also a commercial offering for that. It has some extra features like uh, asset compliance. Uh, you can use it as storage layer and then integrate it with these other systems. Unlike the, uh, many of the other systems that I've shown, these systems are column-oriented. So it's, it's very good for storing large, large tables that have more or less always the same kind of data. Uh, because everything, if you store everything in columns, then the query the query uh, engine can very much optimize the access to this data. Right, next is distributed databases. So instead of using just one system, you have you put everything on a cluster, and if you need more capabilities, more performance, you just scale up. You add more workers, and you get more, more performance. There's some very interesting ones. So for example, Jugabyte DB is a very interesting one. It's Postgres compatible. It's also Cassandra compatible. I'm going to get to Cassandra in one of the next slides. Um, Postgres, of course, is uh, basically a standard SQL database. Cassandra is a document database, so you have best of both worlds, essentially, in one database. It's open source. You can install it on a cluster, on Kubernetes, for example, uh, or on one of the cloud uh, service providers. Cockroach is another approach. They also try to be Postgres compatible. Um, you know, the, the opinions are, you know, go in different uh, directions on whether and how much Postgres compatibility it has or not. Um, Jugabyte is a little better in this respect because they actually expose the wire protocol of Postgres, so you can use just the standard Postgres database driver for that. Uh, single store is for, for those of you who prefer MySQL. Um, sorry, ClickHouse is a performance-oriented uh, database, so it's extremely fast. It's used for log analysis. XSL already mentioned. And if this timer is right, then I'm running out of time. So let's uh, zip through these uh, a bit more quickly. So you have document databases as the next one. So if you want to store, let's say, JSON in a database, then uh, you can use one of these, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch. OpenSearch is a fork of Elasticsearch with under the Apache license. Apache Cassandra is a uh, Apache license system, very high performance for storing database, uh, documents in the database and provides a SQL um, compatible query language. Uh, MongoDB, I guess you most of you will know, uh, it's a very popular document database. And you have Apache CouchDB, which I wanted to mention because if you're developing something that needs to synchronize across different devices, then it can't, Apache CouchDB basically provides all the logic for that for you. Right, 
Time series databases, uh, I'm just going to skim through this. InfluxDB, many of you probably know. Uh, Apache Druid is an alternative, a very good one, a very fast one to InfluxDB. You also have CrateDB, which combines Elasticsearch documents with uh, you know, Presto and Trino, as I've shown on the previous slide, uh, to, to give you the SQL access. And then there is a Postgres extension called TimescaleDB, which is open source. You can just add it to your Postgres, and then you have a time series database. If you want immutability, which sometimes is, is interesting, for example, for auditing purposes, so audit immutability basically means that you cannot change the database content without logging the, the changes. Um, there's ImmoDB. Apache Pino is another one, which is great for time series because it's append only, and it's very fast. How many of you do machine learning with databases? Okay, just a few. So it's a, this is very interesting because you can actually run the machine learning inside the database. So you don't have to transfer the data out of the database to the machine learning and then put it back into the database. You can just use, for example, Matlib to directly run it inside the database kernel, which is, of course, much more performant that way. If you have a database that doesn't support this, you can use a proxy for this called MindsDB, and you can put MindsDB in between your application and the database, and it will then provide this kind of functionality for you. And of course, there are lots of other different databases. Like, for example, key value storages I haven't even covered uh, in here. You can run databases on GPUs. You can have them specific for uh, geo data, for, for GIST data. You have graph databases, vector databases. If you do machine learning, you can store your, your vectors uh, directly in the database. Uh, today, we had a talk about TypeDB, which is a strongly typed database. And there, there are many other different uh, databases for specific leads. So I've given you lots and lots of options. I hope this was uh, helpful in some way. I'm going to upload the slides because uh, there's so much information on the slide that might, might be useful for you. Uh, so you can then have a look and uh, feel free to ask me any questions. So the main takeaway from, from the talk is basically you should never stop to, to learn and always try out new things because so much is happening in IT and so many new developments are uh, coming. It's always very, very good to, to stay on, on top of everything and, and look into these things. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I think I have some time for questions, maybe. Thank you very much, Marc-Andre. Uh, so the first one. What databases have you used yourself in the last 10 years? What were the most unusual or interesting ones that you have encountered? Well, of course, I used MySQL and Postgres, mo mostly Postgres, actually, because I like Postgres a lot, and I think the community is just fantastic. But I've also uh, used other databases, like key value storages. Um, some of them I, I wrote myself because I didn't have any at, at the time. Um, but basically, I, I moved away from, from doing things myself and just try to, to use whatever is out there on the market because other people can implement these things so much better than I can. Um, I had some, some great experience with, um, with one of these databases that I wrote, the key value storage. I had to deploy that, that system at a customer site on an old IBM AIX system, and it kept crashing. So um, I very quickly had to re basically rebuild the database layer I had in the application to use a, a Postgres database. Is there any engine that would support relational, graph, and time series at the same time? One that you could recommend? The, the only one I know is, uh, is probably uh, Postgres with uh, lots of extensions. So the nice thing is about Postgres is that you can add new functionality to it by uh, by adding extensions, the, the, uh, what's, what's not so nice is that if you want to go to the cloud with this, you have to basically run and manage the Postgres installation yourself because the typical cloud vendors, they don't allow you to, to install extensions to the database. So that's something to consider. But if you want to have you know, one of these databases that basically kind of does everything for you, then Postgres is probably a very good bet. Since you mentioned the cloud, when would you recommend to use a cloud-based or third-party hosted database? When would you advise against it? So I, I think I've already given the advice for, for why to use uh, cloud services. It's always very good if, you want, if you're just starting up with, with whatever idea you have you want to implement it. 
it's much better to focus on implementing your idea rather than implementing the infrastructure that goes around it. So you can very easily start with a cloud provider. They give you everything. They manage everything for you. And then later on, when the costs explode, you can then reconsider and then move to, to other uh, technology, other hosters, maybe host it yourself. And what was the second part? Uh, just just archived it. Uh, there was, uh, when would you advise against it? Um, well, if if things get too expensive, then you know, for example, with Amazon, if you if you start using Amazon and you put lots and lots lots of data in it, it's very easy to get to like a five-figure dollar amount that you have to pay to Amazon every single month. I've I've been there. I've worked in the company and was CTO of that company, and I had to pay these these charges, and it's just enormous. Uh, and at some point, I mean, maybe, you know, like if you're in the tens of thousands of dollars per month, depends on, on your business model, it may be worthwhile still doing that. But uh, if you are scaling above that and you, you start to pay like five digit numbers, then uh, it becomes something that, you know, moving out of the cloud and into your own data centers becomes more viable and something that you should consider. There are lots of uh, cloud companies that have, that have done this. So... Um, yeah, I don't remember which one it was now, but I think it was something like Uber or um, or LinkedIn. They they moved out of the AWS cloud and then into their own data centers. What is your opinion on Citus as an alternative to Green Palm DB? Yeah, Citus is another alternative to um, to Green Plum. Citus, but it's Green Plum is. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like uh, th those are two, two systems that you can use for Postgres, two extensions that you can use for Postgres to, to move to a data, uh, data warehouse kind of setup. Um, I would recommend Greenplum because it has a better, you know, better uh, support. There's a company behind it. You can buy support from them if you like. Um, I believe with Citus you can do the same, but I don't have a lot of experience with Citus. BigQuery allows to query data stored in, in an object uh, storage, S3 included. Doesn't it make BigQuery a data lake? Yes, to a certain extent it does. Of course, uh, the, the, if you have a data warehouse, then what you typically do is you combine the data that you put into the database uh, with other metadata, and then you, you create ties between the data inside the database. Uh, with a data lake, you basically do that sometimes afterwards. So first you put in all the data and then you think about ways of um, interconnecting the data with other logic. What are the reasons to run databases on the GPU? Well, some, some uh, vendors need very, very fast uh, analytics. For example, if you do uh, things like, uh, if, if you're serving out ads and, and there's an auction going on, right at the time when the user clicks on a certain link, and then the, the page has to decide which ad to, to display to the, to the user. You only have a few milliseconds to run everything. And if you want to do that at scale, then having a GPU help you with that is, is crucial. Um, GPUs are also very good for data exploration. So if you're a data scientist, for example, and you have a data set that, let's say, um, has a few hundred gigabytes, you want to move around in that data set and do queries on the data set, maybe even interactively, uh, then you need a GPU as well, because normal databases can't handle that anymore. And the last two questions, they are both about document databases. So what are the advantages of document databases compared to something like JSON type in Postgres? Well, that is a good question. <laughs> um, I mean, the JSON support in Postgres is actually uh, is excellent by now. Uh, it wasn't some years ago. So people are just starting to, to put the data into, uh, into Postgres uh, using the JSON field. Um, what document databases have as a, um, you know, a better approach to, to storing documents is that you, you don't necessarily have to have some kind of idea about what kind of schema these documents have. And you can make changes to those schemas very easily without disrupting your, your service. Um, I would always recommend, if you have lots of data that is, uh, you know, like text structured, for example, I would always, always recommend using an open search for that, putting data in open search. 
because it's uh, very much geared towards text analysis, um, actually uses Lucene internally. And uh, so that's, that's definitely a, a plus. Postgres does have some features in terms of uh, text queries, but not as advanced as OpenSearch does. And the last one, do you think that document databases are overused or underused? I think they were overused for um, a number of years when all this, you know, the NoSQL kind of movement came out and everyone thought that, okay, we don't need SQL anymore. We don't even need to learn SQL anymore. I think those days are over by now. I do think that document databases have a very good uh, reason for, for existence. So there are definitely workloads that need document databases and where document databases are much more, uh, you know, a much more usable approach. For example, if you have log data, you want to put into, um, you want to put that into a document database because queries are run much faster. It's much more geared towards that kind of data load. If you put log data into, let's say, a Postgres, then it's probably going to run slower than um, on, let's say, an open search. Thank you so much, Mark Andre. Okay. Thank you. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.